Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the What is Money show. I am sitting down again today with Mr. Lester, and we're going to be diving deeper into this book, The Twilight of Gold. And I'll open by reading an excerpt here that I think really highlights the importance of gold as a base layer operating system, perhaps is the right analogy, to a lot of human action in the world, whether we realize it or not. The author writes, quote, the gold standard in the classical sense was part and parcel of an economic order. It was a keystone of the system of public law, social customs, and institutions that rested on what appears in perspective as virtually unlimited freedom of consumer choice business enterprise, and markets, unquote. So this is something I've, I've gained in my study of, of monetary history is that like gold is foundational to a lot of this socioeconomic reality that we take for granted. Even, you know, something as simple as crossing the street when the little hand light switches to a man walking light like those rules are enforced by a monopoly of force that rests upon gold at its foundations so it's not something a lot of people are are aware of can you explain that for me well sure so if a you know you're abiding by the rules of a city essentially those rules are enforced by the police. That police force is nested within the military. The military is nested within the geopolitical order. And the primary asset of the geopolitical order is gold, right? The reason the United States is the superpower is because we have the most gold in the world. And we, we use that to, to fund the most dominant military in the world. So I've come to see a lot, you know, a lot of human history as people fighting over the gold, which, you know, as I think it was Rothschild said, um, give me the power to issue a nation's currency and I care not who makes its laws. It's like he who has the gold makes the rules kind of thing. Do you feel like gold still has that power? Well, China is today both the biggest net buyer and producer of gold. And we see central banks worldwide increasing their gold position at the same time they debase their currencies. And so far as I can tell, if, there, if war were to break out and one country conquered another, tribute would be demanded in gold or their central bank would be raided as you know, Nazi Germany um, did to countries that it conquered in the 20th century. So yeah, I think, it, I think gold is still the premier asset in the world and it, the, it's foundational to much of the law and order that we take for granted, uh, even though we may not understand the connections. I think I think gold is is the premier asset, but I do view Bitcoin as something disruptive to gold. Uh, it's just unclear to me how that disruption plays out necessarily. I uh, through Bitcoin, this is ironic, but through Bitcoin, I came to love gold. It was like when I started my education, I didn't know anything about gold, didn't care about it. I'd say a year or two into my education, I started buying gold really aggressively. And, and a lot of it was like listening to Luke Groman and some of the people talk about some of the like uh, political outcomes for gold. And then some of the old writers, they just write in terms of, <laughs> when I used to read Hardy Boys mysteries, every time they would describe what Chet brought on a picnic for lunch, I would want to eat what, like if Chet would always have like a ham sandwich and apple pie, I would, be, oh, I got to go eat ham sandwich and apple pie. So now I'm reading Rothbard about uh, 
Jones being paid in an ounce of gold. And I'm like, I just want it. I want it. So I started buying it and I, I loved owning it. And I remember Trace Mayer talking about holding your gold and how, how, how therapeutic and, and, and how you feel the power of it. And I thought that is so weird, but then I would do it. I bought gloves to hold it with. I mean, I was, I fetishized. It was fantastic. And, um, and then I listened to sailors, his, I think it was his Preston. One of his first, he did like four interviews right away. He did one with Anthony Pompliano. I think he did one with Preston and, um, and maybe one other, like his first round after he started buying Bitcoin. And there's one of them, I think it might've been the Pompliano interview. I was a half hour into that interview and I had sold almost all my gold within a half hour. It just turned me around completely. And I just thought, and, and I, to this day, I, I would love to be able to buy it again because I love owning it and I see its value, but I don't think I can afford it because I think, you know, I think Bitcoin, you'll eventually be able to get like, Two three hundred ounces of gold for a bitcoin, or vice vice versa. So I just thought I just can't afford it in bitcoin terms right now. I'm not, I'm not you know, um, but I would like to own it again. I I recall I think when we first connected at the dinner in Los Angeles, you were probably in that in that phase of of fetish, fetishizing gold. Yeah. Um, and you know, I there is something very powerful about holding physical gold. I don't. It's I don't, a lot of gold bugs will tell you this. It's almost indescribable. But I too own very little physical gold. Um, I just think that, yeah, Bitcoin is this. The digital age is really going to throw a lot of things upside down. And I think gold, I mean, gold, the digital disruption of gold would be the greatest testament to the disruptive power of digital technology yet, in my opinion, because it's the oldest, most important tool we have, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's foundational to the geopolitical order. So if that is disrupted by digital technology, I think that, hmm, that really, um, speaks to the impact, like the, the, the transformation of an age we're going into, right? We're really moving from one age to another um, in ways that are almost incomprehensible. So and it's happening. The, Sorry, go ahead. The rough analogy, and this is like, I'm kind of at the end of my rope here, but it's like, imagine trying to describe the industrial age to a farmer, you know, it's like, it just doesn't, how would you, what language would you use? The farmer would have no analogy. You know, you'd be, you'd be really grasping um, to try and find the right words to assemble the mental picture of what the industrial age ultimately culminated into to someone uh, living in an agrarian society. It would just be very difficult, right? So I think something like that is happening again, where we're trying to describe the digital age and what the the repercussions of it but it's very difficult to grab the right words to even imagine what it what it could be when i'm when i'm staring i'm sort of like staring into the fog of the future to try and figure out what what it looks like with bitcoin as the center of value as the value network and it's so it's so hard for me to comprehend i do think there's a chance that when the dust settles the new system will look exactly like the old system. I think there's a chance that it we switch over to Bitcoin, but fundamentally things are kind of the same. There's still a dollar. No one really sees it. Hmm. But I also feel like I also have a, a, a stronger sense that it will be really, it'll be so unrecognizable that my inability to comprehend it now and to create a mental picture of it in my mind is because it's going to be so different that I just, it's just the kind of thing that's incapable of the imagination of a single person. Mm. Because the concept of a money 
at the center of civilization that you can't make more of is so different. I just don't think people understand how different that is. I feel like I try, I, I, I imagine if there was one neighborhood in all of the world that, okay, here's the scenario. Aliens come to earth. They're ultimate, they're, they have ultimate control and ultimate weapons. And they said, we have, we have one we're going to life is we're not we're not here to hurt you we're not going to change life except for in one respect there's all there's only going to be houses in in shaker heights ohio it's a nice neighborhood only places where we have houses is shaker heights everyone else has to live in their cars you can still have jobs you can still shop, the economy still exists, but everyone else has to live in their cars. And what, however, however you get by. And if you try and build a car that is the size of a house or has house-like properties, we will laser you to death instantly. And so life kind of goes on. You know, like there's still an economy, but just everyone's living in their cars except for the housing market in Shaker Heights. So Shaker Heights, Ohio now comes to embody the value of all real estate on the globe. So then the question is, if you owned one of those houses, would you ever sell it? If you, if you had the choice, would you sell it? Would, it would, a sh- would a house in Shaker Heights ever come on the market apart from someone dying or someone defaulting on a loan? And I think the answer is no. And I think that the reservation demand for Bitcoin will go to infinity. And that the meme of 21 million divided by, the 21 million divided by infinity is, is even wrong. It's less. It's going to be three or three or four million divided by infinity because that's going to be the circulating supply. I, I just don't think infinity divided by twenty one million. I think is the right way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, that that I don't the possibility of that. I don't. I don't even understand the comp the the implications of that. I love that. I love that analogy. Um, yeah, because again, you know, we were saying this offline earlier. It's like, how do you cash out of your Bitcoin position because you are already in the ultimate form of cash that has ever existed? This is such a such a struggle for me, and I think this is one of the most one of the most basic misapprehensions about Bitcoin. That Bitcoin is the most Bitcoin. This is the truth. Bitcoin is the most conservative investment you can make. Yeah. You are not a renegade if you buy Bitcoin. You're not experimenting. <laughs> you look at look at Sailor's history. Sailor was a guy who up until last year believed in holding cash. Mm-hmm. And he was angry at the capital markets for not valuing like his safe stewardship of his country's balance sheet and his fealty to his customers. Mm. That is the most conservative outlook and it mirrors my own. You know, um, I've always, I've always made sure to have like plenty of rainy day cash. I'm just not a risk taker financially. And yet my allocation of Bitcoin is one would think like that's super bold what you've done because you, seem to be all in. <laughs> but I'm like, no, it's this is the most conservative thing I've ever done. And I have lain awake nights thinking, how can I lock it in? How can I cash out? Well, there's nothing to cash out into. Right. I would have done it. No, it's such a great point. It's um it's interesting that it's almost a reflection of how far awry the world has gone, right? To view something like Bitcoin as this radical, risky, you know, investment, which is somewhat understandable given 
the the media coverage surrounding it and the the volatility in U.S. dollar terms and the general ignorance of money. I mean, I, I get it, but once you get it, like once you get Bitcoin, the whole thing inverts, right? It's like it goes from being the this fringe play, magic internet money speculation, if, you know, is the commonly used term, to the to actually the most conservative, inviolable, lowest counterparty risk, trust minimized asset you can own, period. And it, I'm reminded here of that quote, I forget who said it, it was that the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will despise those who speak it, something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And, we, you know, if money is just something that maps onto time and energy, right? As you said at the, the open, the opening of the series, that it's essentially a I forgot the term, it's a reflection of the economy, something to that effect. So like an anti-value. Like an anti-value, right? It maps onto the time and energy we use to produce value, then it seems pretty apparent that 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 you know, something like Bitcoin that maps onto it perfectly is effectively the truth of money, sort of what gold used to be, right? It was this pragmatic truth of, of money because there was a proof of work necessary to produce it. No one could counterfeit it, right? It, it, it provided an authority beyond the grasp of humans, right? There was a, there was a, a transpersonal authority, I guess, that gold applied it applied this disciplinary force on market actors because no one could break the rules and that's effectively what we get with bitcoin right it's just this a new form of digital money that no one can break or twist the rules so all you can do is play by the rules and and the rules of bitcoin are you know really do not steal right work work to produce value so it's really interesting how that, I mean, it's, it, shat, it shatters society as we know it. Because today we we have this fiat world where assertions about reality are put forth as if they supersede reality itself. Yeah. And Bitcoin, again, flips us back. It's like, no, whatever is worked and discovered and valued by the most people will be. Versus what someone uh, in a position of authority says will be. So <laughs> it's quite philosophic. You well, mentioned, you, 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 go ahead. You've really elegantly brought us back to the quote that you opened this session with because that passage, I, I noted that passage as well. And it's one of those quiet, unassuming passages that this book is full of. You know, you have to like, I just stumbled onto it again. I'm going to read it because we've now been talking and people might not remember, but you started with it. The gold standard in the classical sense was part and parcel of economic order. It was the keystone of the system of public law, social customs, and institutions that rested on what appears in perspective as virtually unlimited freedom of consumer choice, business enterprise, and markets. And that that just maybe fourth of the time I saw that, I was like, Virtually unlimited freedom, the virtually part is key because it was a freedom based on consequences and the the possibility of failure. And when there's real limits as imposed by nature, as imposed by gold, that no one can just make more without expending energy, that means that the possibility of insolvency is now real. And once the possibility of insolvency is real, then you have freedom because it's freedom built on an inviolable rule set. And you can't have freedom and creativity without a framework of rules. I, I think, I mean, sorry, you can, you can, but I think, I think limits make society much more creative. And I think that because there was one rule that no one could change. That was the foundation for, as he says, 
It was the keystone of a system of public law, social customs, and institutions that rested on what appears in perspective as virtually unlimited freedom. But it was virtually unlimited freedom. It wasn't total freedom. It was not freedom to do one thing, which was to make more gold. I, I think it's a really important passage. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's this constraints breed creativity. I've heard yeah. it said before. And, you know, we, we hmm. man, it's, it goes deep because there's this Petersonian thing too, where he talks about, it's from the old Jewish Kabbalah. And it says, what does God a being that is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So omnipotent is all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent can be everywhere. What does an unlimited being like that lack? And the answer is limitation, right? So it's limitation, or we could maybe say scarcity in the sense of economics, that gives life its meaning in a lot of ways. So, you know, we live in a, a reality of scarce resources. And if we are using, and we, we trade, right? We trade and innovate to overcome scarcity. But if we're using an instrument that does not reflect the wins and losses, the real world wins and losses, of our trials against scarcity, right? Like if money does not actually reflect real points on the board, so to speak, and you can just print the points, then we all lose our fucking minds basically because we can't play the game. We don't know who's actually contributing to civilization and who's detracting from it. It just becomes a, a, a postmodernist, relativistic, senseless game, something like that when you abuse the money. I, I, I really agree. And I think that um, there's that, were you following that, the Mike, Mike Green episode about a year ago when he came on the scene with his Bitcoin criticisms and then he debated Nick Carter? I've listened to the Nick Carter debate. I'm actually debating Mike too. Um, you are. You have that January. scheduled? Yes. Well, on Real Vision. That is very exciting. Yes. Um, I felt like his foray into a Bitcoin attack was a massive failure of intellect from someone who I otherwise respect. And it, and so it took up a lot of mental space for me for like a few weeks because I had to, I had to deconstruct his argument, which for, I did for myself. I didn't do it for anyone else, but I will go back to earlier interviews of his that I thought were really good, not Bitcoin related. And he was talking about MMT there's a, a tweet from Stephanie Kelton that I cannot unsee or forget about. She talks about that the the stimulus, the the um, the stimulus, the coronavirus stimulus. You, you could call them dollars that come out of it, or you could call them cares points. <laughs> they're not dollars; they're points. And Mike's point in this interview a long time ago was that whether you agree with them to or not, it is a descriptive reality of our system. It does accurately convey the current system. Sure. And, you know, him saying that sort of released me from my resistance to MMT. And I was like, well, whether I'd like it or not, he's right. It is, it is a, it is descriptive of the current reality and I'm indignant about it. And I think that it's, and it has, it has hurt me as I like tried to save for a house for 10 years during the produ most productive uh, income earning years of my adulthood. And yet I couldn't save fast enough, but 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 yet that he he's right that is the reality and you you just said it and i think that it um it it warps it warps everyone's experience in a way that's uh it just goes back to it, it goes back to um her very early problems i've had just psychologically with the concept of money and then a set of behaviors that you carry with you your whole life your relation to savings Mm -hmm. the, the idea of a world built on savings, I get misty eyed about it because I'm a saver. Michael Saylor is a saver mm -hmm. and Bitcoin is for savers. 
Yeah, it's well said. And, you know, to look at MMT as a descriptive truth of what is, you know, description is not justification. <laughs> right, right. You can't just say, oh, well, this is what it is. So let's move on. It's like, okay. I the real, I mean, the deeper question is, you know, why or what ought to be something like that. And this idea of, I mean, I think the most resonant analogy is just sports, right? Like we, you play the game based on fixed rules so we can discern who the best teams and athletes are. Right. If you somehow gave one team or one franchise or one athlete the ability to twist the rules at, you know, any margin you want, right? 1% rule twisting up to 100%, that would fuck up the whole game. It would ruin the whole sport. And that's what we have. And that's exactly what we have. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean. And the idea, man, people... People, the degree to which people in my life don't understand this, when you say to someone, I was at a parent, uh, a parents, you know, for my kid's school, happened to get on the subject of home values because that's what everyone talks about. And I was like, well, you understand that, of course, that uh, homes are not becoming more valuable, but the dollars that the, the portion of your dollar that buys the home is becoming less valuable. That's your dollar is split into quadrants or sections the part of your dollar that buys streaming and uh unhealthy food is gaining or staying still in purchasing power but the part of your dollar that buys assets or homes is actually being cut in half every couple of years like in half every few years and that is that explains the quote unquote rise of home values and like to see someone you know, this is a person who's uh, this. This person was a super, super intelligent public defender, person working at the height of their intellect, and they just had never occurred to them to think of it that way. Just you know, homeowner, dude in his fifties, just they had never never thought of it. How many people just don't think of it that way? Most, ninety percent, and then what happens? You know, like. I think, well, God, at first I think, God, no one's thinking of it that way. And then I think, no, 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 no. A lot of people are thinking about it this way. I talk to them on Twitter every day. Well, how many doublings are we until until half of the income earning people in this country think that? I think very few. And Mm -hmm. back to what you're saying earlier about gold being disrupted by Bitcoin. The reason why I sold all my gold in a half hour was... It actually took me longer. I made the deal to, to sell it in a half hour. Then I had to ship it, put it in the mail. <laughs> but the reason why I did that was because all this shit is happening so much faster than I thought it would happen. And when I was buying gold, because I love gold and because I thought, well, look, it's not as good as Bitcoin. But I think, you know, the world realizing that is at least five years away. This is in 2019, 2020 five, six, maybe 10 years away. So for the next five to 10 years, I still think gold has, I think that it's happening now. Like, like now. It's just happening faster mm-hmm. than I thought it would happen. Yeah, this, um, I had to find this quote, but it also really stands out to me about the importance of immutable, unchangeable rules, right? We, mm-hmm. and pe- some people don't like it when we describe game theory or, or like markets as games. They're like, it's not a game, you know, it's real life. But that's not the point. The point is there are game, what, there are competitive and cooperative dimensions to human existence that are reflected in games, right? So they're, they, they share the same properties in many ways. So when we describe like the fixity of rules being important in a game, like everyone gets that, it's like, okay, that same concept applies to reality, right? This, this real game we call, you know, the global economy and friends, friends Kafka has this amazing quote. 
justice must stand quite still or else the scales will waver and a just verdict will become impossible. So it's like we need this immovable, axiomatic um, money or measure to discern all of these movements and activities against, right? To measure the points in something like that. Like there has to be, it has to be anchored in something. And gold was the anchor. <laughs> and now Bitcoin, I think, is just an, an even you have greater assurances of constancy or invariability in Bitcoin than you do even gold, which is in a mind blowing it. Yeah. I think when you really see it, it just shatters your world to you from top to bottom. It's yeah. like, again, you, back to the guy crossing the street is like, would the guy be crossing the street if gold had never been the centerpiece to the world? You know, I don't know. I don't know what we, we would be doing. So what happens when that, that rule sets disrupted? It just percolates through the whole stack. Um, I, I want to, you, you said something earlier I wanted to drill into a bit. You think Bitcoin will succeed and then dollars will go on existing. What is that world? How does that world look to you? Because if, if, if Bitcoin is disruptive to gold, what then upholds the value of a dollar? I think I think that I think that will happen. I'm, I'm going to say something that I thought I wrote this down, and then I and then I I deleted it because I thought it's too scary a thing to say. <laughs> but I think that for all Bitcoin's benefits, I'm I'm also afraid of Bitcoin. You need to respect it, and I think that Bitcoin has the potential to also usher in the most crushing poverty the world has ever seen. And that is because you cannot make more when you need to. And so if you have a local government that is not prepared and they don't have any savings and they don't have any credit, there will be no financial power to help them and the people there will suffer. Now, throughout the history of fiat money, printed paper monies, there's like one theme that runs constant and it is the simple fact that people will use money. They'll use whatever they are given if they're in a time of need. So you have like one of the first paper monies in the United States. There was a, there was a fort. It was a French fort. I don't remember the cities. It was in, they were, they would periodically go and raid Canadian territory every year. And, and then they'd come back with their winnings and then distribute the winnings. Every every spring they go raid 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 the French territories, and then one year they failed. <laughs> the raid failed, and they had no money. And the local government was like, "Well, we're going to print some." And because the local populace had nothing, they accepted it. And I think that the first the the, the first round of printing was, and we it'll, it's we're going to print forty thousand, and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's in the book Fiat Paper Money. That's it. We're just going to do it one time, and everyone used it because there was nothing else. And then, of course, they went on to print like a million more dollars. But it illustrates the fact that when you have a society in crisis and impoverished, they will use what they are given. And when there's nothing else, a local government will just make something and say, here, use this. And I think that because there's no safety valve in terms of a way to get more Bitcoin, People are just going to have to create something. And that's that's like the first, that's my first answer to why fiat will have to coexist with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. My second answer is more complicated. Let's just go with the first one for now. <laughs> sure hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. 
As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. Maybe to round out our prior discussion or or prior volley there on kind of a philosophic point is that submission to truth is freedom, which sounds like a paradox, but the way I conceive of this is something like, again, you know, using gravity or thermodynamics as an analogy, like the sooner you submit to that reality, you can't really do anything about gravity can't really do anything about thermodynamics. All you can do is deal with them, right? Play within the constraints that they impose upon you. The better you are at the game, right? That's what that's essentially what life is doing, right? Life is this organized disobedience against gravity or thermodynamics, right? Where the whole universe is becoming more entropic yet life turns the tide of entropy, right? We create order. Um, the, the book Leela by Persick, he makes this great point. That you could almost quantify the success of life by how well it has overcome gravity. <laughs> we, you know, humans are the dominant species in the world and clearly we're shooting rockets into space. So um, It's really interesting that, you know, there's this, it's paradoxical, right? You just, you have to submit to the the constraints of these realities in order to create the most freedom, which is counterintuitive in a way, but um, I think it makes a lot of sense if you really parse it apart. Yeah. And everything that's happened up till now, by the way, is also within the rule set of reality, like government's printing money, government's creating money, like reality permits this. Mm -hmm. and I think it's only people being like um, getting hip to the game that the, that the larger players are playing and the fact that we're establishing a new area arena where the rules are different, that will change the rules. There'll be a new game and new rules and Mm -hmm. it'll be Bitcoin's rules, but like no one's violated the rules of the universe so far. In fact, they've done back to what we were saying earlier about inevitability. I think they've just done what is inevitable. They've done what what humans, especially political animals, do. They've sought the most least effort, least yeah. controversial solution to the problem of financing government, which is to just make the money. And it's not their fault that they do it. In fact, it's our fault for going along with it. Right. I any any politician will do the same thing. All have. They're all smart. They're all incentive driven. They're all rational, incentive driven actors. That's what politicians are. You can't be mad at them for this. Mm-hmm. So, are you? Do you have no reaction to uh, Bitcoin will create the most crushing poverty ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna let that one go? Well, I, yeah, I guess in the transition, it's certainly possible. But I feel like the ultimate fix to poverty is the free market. So it's like almost I see it like sort of shifting, right? You're, you're moving from a centrally planned economy that's creating all these distortions and externalities, but people are effectively migrating onto this economy that is, you know, pure positive sum game, right? Where the rules are fixed and all you can do is trade and innovate really to produce wealth. You can't take, you have to engage fully in making, not at all in taking. So it's somewhere like, yeah, maybe certain levels of standard of living or aggregate wealth in these more centrally planned economies will be in rapid decline as a result of Bitcoin monetizing. But at the same time, the little pockets and pools of market actors engaging with Bitcoin and, you know, rebuilding a world on a, you know, laissez-faire free market standard will kind of be picking up the slack. 
So when you say like the most crushing poverty the world has ever seen, I guess I would think that it would be quickly remedied by the market on a Bitcoin standard. You know what? I agree. I think you've talked me out of that one. I, I think you have, because I think that's, we haven't like gotten into the nitty gritty of how the gold standard work and explain the price species flow mechanism, which is like such an elegant concept. But I think that that would, we're jumping around a little bit. I think, I think that would come into play if you were suddenly in a suddenly impoverished society. Yeah. There would be suffering in the short term, but also your cost of labor would go down. And because Bitcoin is a global money, you could instantly get paid from anywhere in the world and then you could earn it. And then that Bitcoin would have a lot of purchasing power in your local economy and you could earn your way out of it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So it does seem like the, the fix comes a lot faster. Yeah. And then the, you know, the mining, hmm, I mean, seems like, so it, forgive me if this is a, a stress, a, a stretched analogy, but kind of in the same way that Uber or Airbnb provides this kind of unemployment safety net for a lot of people, mm-hmm. or you can always just kind of turn on the app and like go to work. Basically, you know, you don't need to go through the whole job search and application process interview, blah, blah, blah. You can literally just go to work on an app. Now, Bitcoin mining may be sort of similar for failing economies where it's like, whatever, nothing's working every, you know, we don't have any good imports, exports, but surely we can produce some energy of some kind and, and enter Bitcoin mining. And I know it's not true everywhere evenly, but, um, just in the event of this of this economic cataclysm in the wake of, you know, frankly, central planning or statism, it seems like Bitcoin mining could be this kind of uh, somewhat of a safety net in some regions to just get back to work. Right? It's like if you if you can't do anything else, just go and set up a Bitcoin mining facility. Well, we have to talk about we have to we haven't talked about Bitcoin mining yet, and I've been getting so into the economics of mining and the concept of mining recently. Mm-hmm. It has to be threaded into discussion. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. You know, like what we're going to talk about, what we've talked about so far, and what we're going to talk about over the rest of the series is the concept of convertibility and and how um, like uh, depository institutions have broken their their promise of convertibility time and time again throughout the thousand years of fiduciary media. Bitcoin has built into it a system of convertibility that is unbreakable. There is no Mm. rule that can break the convertibility rule of electrons for Bitcoin. It's not traditional convertibility where you have a note. And of course, gold has the same convertibility too. If you can exercise energy, if you can go and like take a walk in the desert, you can get gold. No one Mm -hmm. thinks about it, but it is true. You have the same mechanism for gold. So there is like a built-in convertibility system that is not traditional, that is always in force with Bitcoin. And I was staring at the having Epoch, a chart of having it, just, you know, go to, go to, I'll give you a link. There's like a good, a good table and just stare at the chart of the having rewards from now until the year 2139, (laughs) just like stare at it. In the year 2136, the block reward will be one set. And in that halving epoch, which is 210,000 blocks, the halving reward will be 210,000 sets for all the whole four years plus transaction fees. And you look at the halving schedule from now until then, there's... There's Bitcoin to be had. It's I know that like 90% of it is mine, but there's big, there's a mm. lot of Bitcoin yet. And the more, you know, if 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 this idea that Bitcoin is like the one real estate, the one neighborhood that encompasses the value of all real estate on the planet, mm-hmm. then there's a lot of value left to be gained. Especially if the circulating supply of Bitcoin is three to four million in total. And the entire monetary premium of the world gets absorbed into this asset, then there's a lot of value left to be mined and you can always convert your electrons to Bitcoin. Yeah, great way to put it. I've actually done the spreadsheet on that 
And it's staggering. Actually, if you look at, if you use the stock to flow ratio as your metric, I think it goes up by 1.1 million percent or something through the end of the century. <laughs> like it's, it, we can't even, we cannot get our head around it or right? we cannot. No. And again, this, this goes back to that old quote that the, the greatest inability of humans or well, the greatest shortcoming of humans is our inability to comprehend the exponential function. And what we're dealing with in Bitcoin is an exponential decay function of new supply issuance. And we, like you said, what, what did you say? One sat was the... One, one sat per block is the block reward in the last halving era. I mean, the orders of magnitude separating, you know, here and there is just, it, it's... You can't get your head around it. I don't. I actually think we don't have the biological wiring to really get your head around it. You can you can do it, right? I've done it. I've created the spreadsheet, stared at the chart, looked at the um, the factors of change, but it is it's incredible to say the least. Um, it's yeah. I love your description of convertibility as a vote of no confidence. You know, it's just saying the institution that was charged with handling monetary flows. If you ever lose faith in that institution for any reason, converting that contract, which was your banknote for money, which was gold, that was your vote saying, I don't, I don't believe you guys anymore. I don't believe in the integrity of this, this institution. Give me my money. Right. As, uh, if you translated this to modern hip hop speak, it might be like, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a broken contract, right? At the end of the day, it's a broken contract is all it is. So with Bitcoin, we get at least the equipment to build an institution with, un- I'll say way less breakable contracts. You could damn near make them unbreakable if it's done properly. Um, and I think the market would go that way. And again, back to the rules, like if we, if we have, there's only really two ways to organize human beings and it's by conflict or by contract. So if contracts can be broken, then we're going to end up having conflict over who gets to decide the exception to those contracts. But if contracts cannot be broken, as in the case of Bitcoin convertibility, then all we have to do is agree to the terms of the contract, the unbreakable contract and get along peaceably. Yeah. I mean, money printing is a, is a total violation of property rights. It's It's a violation of, of all contracts. All contracts are in violation of each other in this, in this, in our current system. That is, yes. that is the reality. Yes. Well, convertibility, there's like some resonant themes throughout this book. And that's, that's actually one of the biggest ones. And I think that's just something that Bitcoiners relate to. I'm going to, I'm going to rattle off these themes. And we can talk about each one a little bit more. Mm. I feel like the big themes for me are the value of monetary orthodoxy over generations, which we already touched on earlier a little bit convertibility loss of central bank independence the massive growth and abuse of the credit system and this is a big one which we're going to talk about a lot which is the application of the interest rate mechanism this mm. this, this is like one of my biggest light bulbs from this book that i think i think will be instructive for people to understand how the interest rate mechanism is so so completely broken It's like they, it's like, it's like someone created a bow and arrow and then someone else came along and said, let's use it to jam a door open. (laughs) No, it was created as a, it's created to be born at bow and arrow. Well, no, we're going to, that's a terrible analogy. It's just a tool that's not, it's not being used for what it was, what it was built for. And it's broken. It's just completely, it's like someone built a, let me try again. Someone built a bow and arrow. Someone else came along. Take two of my, of my analogy. (laughs) Someone built a bow and arrow. It's perfect for hunting. And someone else broke the arrow in half and said, I will use it for chopsticks. <laughs> and, and the first person's like, well, you can't use the chopstick. There's no, first of all, that's for sushi. Second of all, if we don't hunt for the food, there's no chopsticks to eat with. There's no food to eat chopsticks with. Okay. So we'll talk about that. And then this, this is a broader, broader theme of human discretion versus automaticity. Mm-hmm. How much in our, in our financial system is like based on like these fully automated processes versus human discretion. I think the banking system, especially the central banking system, tries to give this illusion of 
oh, it's kind of like autom- we automatically adjust based on these scientific variables we get. But really, it's just like a bunch of it's just it's just human discretion. And it's just a couple people using their discretion. And that is, you know, Bitcoin is like Bitcoin has brought about the end of discretion. And that is a huge responsibility. But that's where the value comes from. So, that's yeah, excellent point. I just want to say that 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 last one, discretion versus automaticity, if I'm saying that correctly, it ties in my mind to this ephemeral concept of central bank independence as well. It's almost like the central bank was trying to emulate the properties of gold, right? Because gold indeed was independent and indeed did impose automaticity, if I'm saying that correctly again. Um, I think you are. But the bank, like, so there, it's impossible for a central bank to be independent, right? Because back to your first point of monetary orthodoxy that I'm sorry, this was Alexander de, de Tocqueville's idea that the operation of institutions depends on the minds of those that run them, not on the laws by which they are regulated. All right. So once you introduce this very concept of a central bank, it's run by human beings. They're going to operate in service to their own individual self-interest. You've you I think it's an oxymoron, right? You can't a central bank cannot be independent. A central bank is dependent upon the interest, the self-interest of the governors that run it. Whereas something like they, gold is more, it's dependent on the self-interest of the entire market, right? That's why it became money. Yeah. There's a good passage on this idea, but, but he he talks about there was a time when I think central banks left to their left left on their own to their own devices. I think that historically, not now, but historically, central bankers did not want to be under the thumb of a government mm. and left to their own devices. I think they identified their own personal self-best interest with the sanctity of the currency. Mm-hmm. And so it was in their own best interest to um, protect their own solvency and to protect the value of the money. And um, that got taken away from them. Yeah. And then we have a new breed of central bankers that self that the people who've self-selected themselves into the job were the ones who were more willing to become political animals because the central banks, you know, once once the central banks had bought all the paper of the government, they never could get out of it. The, the, yes. the only way they could possibly get free was to have the government settle its debts and move on. And then the central bank could go back to managing the money. But as long as the central bank owned most of the government debt, you know, the government debt is just is just is just the biggest corporation in the country. They mm-hmm. just have the largest budget to spend the most. And when their debt is the primary instrument of the central bank, then they have the largest effect on the money market. And they can just, they, they, the, the central bank can never get outside of the gravity of the government once that happens. And that has just, I don't think it's ever changed since basically since World War. I think World War I changed this forever. Yes. Yeah, and it, the, the crux of it again is convertibility. It is. I'll condition my my prior comment saying that central bank independence is at least achievable mm, so long as there is convertibility, right? Because then you're accountable to the customers ultimately. And again, this is the free market dynamic. So long as you have accountability to the end consumer, that is the most independence you can possibly have. Uh, so when customers can call the bluff effectively by converting banknotes for gold, they can call out fraudulent institutions and even to the point of insolvency, right? If a bank has been irresponsible in their management of the money supply and enough customers call their bluff, that bank folds and more on Therefore, honest banking is incentivized. So I'm reminded here of that, that quote that, you know, liberty means if nothing else telling others what they don't want to hear. Or we could apply this to the market and say, proving others wrong in the marketplace. Like so long as convertibility remained an option, the consumers were sovereign. But once you suspend convertibility, that sovereignty is uh, restricted, right? To the governors of uh, the government or the governors of the central bank uh, in the modern age. Yeah, there's the period. There's a period where the the uh, the Bank of England was like 
the suspended convertibility during the Napoleonic War, and it was called the the uh, the era of restriction. But it wasn't; they didn't really were restricting the bank at all. They're actually freeing them to do what they wanted. It's such a mm-hmm. misnomer. The 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 concept of convertibility, if the literature is right, I wasn't alive then, but if the literature is right, the concept of convertibility was sacrosanct to like to the man on the street. Mm-hmm. And central banks were powerless to change that because there would be revolt. And there were, they would revolt. If, if they if they fucked with the money, the revolt would come in the form of people demanding redemption. Right. And that was the ultimate power that everyone had. And World War I seems to have broken that. It was a psychological shift and everyone let go. There was like an almost an overnight shift away from that being the most important thing. That World War I taught people that there were no limits anymore. Like, oh, we can mm-hmm. pay for this war. Well, maybe we can pay for good. Maybe we can use, use our, this power for good. And maybe we didn't need that limit. And I think that people forgot their most important right, which is convertibility. And so that's what makes me think that how do we teach our children and our children's children, not your keys, not your coins? Like what, what institution can we set up or is it, or are they just destined to, to forget it and go through this whole cycle all over again? Yeah, the, I was, I was left with, <laughs> haunted even by that thought after our last conversation like what Mm -hmm. what can we do to prevent this every three generation regression that we've seen across history and someone pointed out to me that you have to make it a religion ultimately like you you really have to ritualize it in a very deep way and i i don't know exactly what that looks like but you know my instinct tells me we have to tie it to some of our existing wisdom traditions or perhaps religions. I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but you know, just in the Bible, we talk about honest weights and measures. That seems to be timeless wisdom, right? Don't fuck with the weights and measures. Just let everyone have clear understanding of the language we're using to interoperate, interoperate. Uh, I'm not sure how we wrap that in something to protect it against generational drift but um clearly it's there's another possible there's another possibility which is that you know bitcoin will be bitcoin might appreciate so far so fast i think that most people most people will 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 make one phase transition they'll go from thinking bitcoin is dumb why would i buy it and the next time they think about it it will be under the rubric of well, that's not something anyone can afford. Mm. Owning a Bitcoin is like owning a skyscraper or an army. Mm. People just don't own Bitcoins. They won't go through that middle period of, should I buy one? Should I not buy one? <laughs> and then, and, and the people who, who, who make that transition from it's dumb to it's not something people own, they may just continue using dollars the way that, you know, no one, like, do, no one deliberates like, should I buy a skyscraper or an army today? They just live in a house. And so they'll just continue using this normal system. And then people who want to use Bitcoin will, you know, like maybe it'll just be this thing that as Saifedina said, it'll be this like um, vigilante force that will always operate in parallel as a check on the traditional system. That is Mm. one of the possible futures for Bitcoin. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So Maybe we can get into this, then the, the ineffective application of the interest rate mechanism. Yeah. Um, because that, I mean, it's effectively price controls, right? In the simplest terms, uh, a nation's on a gold standard when gold is used as the ultimate numeraire of its monetary system. So... You can use other payment systems. You can use dollars. You can use credits, government IOUs, banknotes, whatever. But they're all redeemable at a guaranteed ratio of gold per monetary unit at the bearer's request. That's And then this scales up to an international gold standard when gold is a numeraire in many countries. They trade with one another. And all the, all the currencies, all the payment methods, they're all redeemable 
in strictly prescribed ratios at their bearer's request. Convertibility. That's all a gold standard is. It's like that. It, that's the only rule. It's the simplest rule, and it's the only rule. And there you have it. You're now on a gold standard. And with that one rule in place led to this thing called the balance of payments system. And the balance of payments confused me for a while because it doesn't mean that like payments are balanced between countries. It doesn't, it does, there's nothing balanced about it. It just means that the books are balanced at the end of the payment period or the month or the year or whatever. So if, if you bought more from me than I bought from you, and we're like exchanging credits for a week or exchanging credits back and forth. Eventually, I'm going to be like, hey, you bought more from me than I bought from you. So you got to pay me gold and settle it. Kind of like, 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 it's like, I, I really think of it as like lightning channels. Like we're, we're sending payments back and forth. I'm like, hey, let's settle the main chain. That's what gold was. So you have countries and individuals, they trade with each other. And if one country imports more than they export, then in other words, they bought more than they sold, they would end up being a net exporter of gold and a net importer of goods and services. Mm -hmm. And so it means that gold would be leaving the economy. And locally, when money leaves your economy, prices go down. It has a deflationary effect locally. This is basically a rough outline of David Hume's price BC flow mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's the way that prices self-adjust between countries. So if money's leaving a country and there's less of it, then overall the idea is that prices fall. And so it means that the saleable values in that country, they're still just as valuable, but they cost less in gold terms. Mm -hmm. And so that makes that country's goods cheaper to import by other countries. And so it brings their sales up and it has a tendency to automatically correct the trade imbalance. Similarly, if a country, if they, if you end up exporting more than you import, then you're going to attract money. Mm -hmm. And if global goods are priced in that money and then goods become more expensive because you're attracting gold, because the volume of money has increased in your country, then your exports will suffer because you've brought more gold in. And so locally, the people, they're not wealthier in real terms, they're wealthier in money terms. And so in that way, the gold standard has this self-balancing mechanism built into it, where a net exporter gets richer, but their stuff gets more expensive, which creates an opportunity for the poorer countries. And then they have the opportunity to then you know, if they want gold, they don't have to, they can just send you stuff for it and it can be cheaper stuff. And then they get gold back because it's cheaper. And that's kind of like, when I kind of wrap my mind around that system, I just thought, oh, that's so beautiful. That's just so, that, that, that makes sense. And then I think about Bitcoin in that context as well in the future. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, fairly straightforward once you get your head around it it's honest accounting right this is the reconciliation of economic flows effectively so it, what one thing that's interesting to me here i think it maps very nicely back to just pure laissez-faire free markets is that ultimately customer or you could say citizen choice is the basis of the gold standard right that is the that's the bedrock of it so long yeah. as the individual had the ability to go and redeem money from the bank at any time, that keeps the whole system honest. Like that one fundamental factor of choice. And then when you start looking at how that operates mechanically, it's the gold flows internationally actually map directly onto the economic energy flows, right? Such that if you are a net importer, right? You're buying more than you're selling then your local money supply will be depleted, right? You'll have money flowing out of your country and prices will decline. And on the flip side, if you are a net exporter, right? You're selling more than you're buying, mm -hmm. then money is going to flow into your country and prices will go up. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's a, back to the word uh, automaticity. Mm -hmm. 
that's what it is, right? It's just an it's a free market, automated, self regulating accounting mechanism for the world. And key to it is that for international trade to happen, you you really do have to have a credit system because mm-hmm. it's just impossible for gold to go back and forth for every single transaction. If you have even one transaction where you don't exchange the gold, you now have a credit system. Right. And so you either have merchants and customers lending and borrowing from each other, or you have a middleman. You can see quickly how a credit system evolves. Mm. And once you have a credit system, then you, you kind of have bank money. And once you have bank money, you sort of have a local currency. So the key to the key to this whole thing is that like, because of gold's value is also its limitations. Its value is its physical, its physicalness. That's why mm-hmm. it's awesome. It continues to exist. If the power shuts off, you still hold your gold. It's great, but that's also its limitation. Mm-hmm. Once you embrace gold, you also inevitably you embrace substitute money, fiduciary media, other types of money. And once you have that, Convertibility at a fixed ratio is the key to the system. And once convertibility and redemption is broken, convertibility at fixed ratio, the whole system breaks. Because it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm if I'm uh, Luxembourg and you're uh, Spain, like I don't want your money. Like my, my, I can't use it. Mm-hmm. So I just want the gold. And you can't use my money. Ultimately, we have to go back into the common money. And if we don't maintain this fixed ratio, we can't trade with each other. Mm-hmm. And then we can't develop what Pauli calls the international division of labor. Mm-hmm. There are just some countries by their geology, their weather, they're just better at certain things than other countries. And so mm-hmm. you have this whole, you have the whole globe working together as one organism to yes. create an economy. And it's possible if they're all on the same unit of, unit of value. Mm-hmm. But once you, once you fuck that up and start like, saying that, well, no, my money is now maybe worth this much, but maybe it's worth that much, then the whole mechanism we're talking about, about how things get priced and then markets get opened up in, in poor countries, that that whole thing get like instantly breaks. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. this, yeah. Go ahead, please. So so this is this is now where the interest rate mechanism comes into play. So now you, once you've, once you've accepted gold, you've accepted bank money or some type of fiduciary media. And then you do have um, a way in which you can, you have another way in which you can potentially counteract short-term effects. If you're a central bank and you're issuing the money and you're like, oh crap, we're, we're losing a lot of gold. We're, we're, a, we're, a net, we're a net exporter of gold and we're losing it. And we had to create some credit money on top of gold and we're losing gold. We can't, as a bank, we can't do anything about the long-term trade balance of our country because we're not the we're not the industry. So we can't actually affect the long-term trend. We can't affect the average. However, we can affect the short-term deviations from the average. And if there's like a season, say there's like a seasonal thing that like, okay, suddenly a bunch of gold leaves to buy wheat every year. And then it's just a seasonal problem. Well, one thing we can, as the central bank do is we can increase the rate of interest and that will attract gold back to our country. And if we're getting too much gold and it's having an inflationary effect, we can repel gold by lowering the interest rate. The interest rate mechanism was designed for one thing only, and that was to attract money when you were losing too much gold temporarily mm-hmm. and to maybe repel some if you had too much. But that's all it was designed to do. It was designed to even out deviations from the average of what was essentially a force beyond your control. Which was effectively governments intervening to try and fix the prices. Again, again, the interest rate is just a price, right? Yeah. To suit a politically determined aim of some kind. 
versus letting the market actually establish a price. Yeah, I guess you're right. I hadn't thought of it. It is. It was. It was the first intervention to try and to, for a smoothing effect. Mm-hmm. You know, it brings it 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 brings up a question that runs throughout this whole body of study for me, and and something that I really haven't answered. Well, I think I have answered it. I don't know. Is price stability natural? Is it a thing? Is it a thing that we should pursue? Does it exist? Does it exist in nature? How do you price things? How do you price things in a stable way? Central banks have been pursuing the stability of what they call the price level, mm-hmm. which is like a very general term. Yeah. What does that mean? It means the, the like literally the aggregate price of everything. Central banks have been pursuing stability of the price level like since they've been invented. And I don't know if that's, I don't know how productive that is. Well, I think it's completely bogus. Um, you know, you already alluded to the vagary of it. Um, and further, I mean, the aim of economics is to deflate prices. Ultimately, we want things to become cheaper. That's how we advance, right? The, that's what productivity is. We can accomplish greater results with less efforts. So, and I think about this um, a number of ways. One is like the lower you can make the price of something, it kind of just falls out of your conscious awareness, right? Where we light, for instance, right? When I turn on the light in my home, I don't really like run a calculation like, oh, how much money am I spending? Do I need to turn this off really quick? But if you rewound the time, you know, a couple hundred years, light was really expensive, right? Where you had to burn a candle or, you know, Back when we had to burn, I think well blubber was for a while the only candle wax we had. And it was very expensive, right? Each lumen, each unit of, of uh, light radiance was very expensive. You had to actually worry about it and think about it and, and ration it and budget it and all these things. But through the division of labor, we've made light extremely cheap, right? Largely through um, hydrocarbons. So that's kind of the point in economics is like you want to make these these wants that we want satisfied, we want to make them so cheap that we don't even have to think about them. And then we can take our conscious awareness and focus on other higher problems. And that, like just to further that analogy a bit with light, it's interesting because when we established artificial light after, after you know, um, sunset, this also opened us up to like, expand our time of learning into the night and what, you know, we could read books and it just increased the rate that we could accumulate knowledge across time. So it has this compounding effect too, as we make prices lower for, for certain critical inputs like light or energy, you know, energy is the ultimate critical input. It, it um, reverberates forward in civilization. We get even wealthier, right. in like a compounding or exponential way. So, Yeah, a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> no, I've, 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 I, 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 I agree with you. I think that, I think that price stability is ultimately it's, it's a mechanism designed to make sure that senior edge remains profitable. That's really all it is. Exactly. Because what price stability actually does is it cloaks the fact that things should be getting cheaper, and if things stay the same then people in general have a sense that things are, oh, great. The price level is staying the same. Well, it right. shouldn't be. It should be getting cheaper. That's right. So there's a margin between implied deflation and, and, and the lack of deflation. There's a little margin where the government can print the difference. If they, if they smooth out something that should be getting 50 cents cheaper, but instead it stays at the price it's at, well, then that's 50 cents they can print that people don't feel. Yep. So I think ultimately that's the role that price stability has served is that like people can collect seniorage and no one will know it. It's and a if skim. You go too far. Sorry, what'd you say? It's a skim or a yeah. rake as they call it right. in a casino, right? They're yeah. just taking a little off the top. And as long as the economy is doing its job and prices are deflating, they can take it off the top without you knowing at all because you just, you're none the wiser, right? It's like this price would have gone down in this alternate reality where we had hard money, but you would net, you could not 
ever know that unless you rationalize from, um, you know, economic principles as we're doing here, you just see prices flat and that's, you know, nothing to be upset about, I guess, but right, you're, not, right. you're being it's, stolen from imperceptibly, I guess is the punchline. Yeah. And you have to, you also, as, as a, um, it's very politically expedient because, uh, you can tell people I'm saving you from prices going up. Well, prices going up is natural too. <laughs> I'm smoothing it. It seems like it's a real service to people, but it actually impedes economic calculation because economic calculation should bring about change of prices. Yeah. The other way like, to think about this is like anything in nature that grows, like growth is not a smooth process anywhere in nature. Show me where growth is smooth. Growth is in, it's inherently a volatile process. It involves change. That's what growth is, right? You're changing from one state to another. To try and induce smooth growth, it's just, you know, you're trying to turn nature into a zoo kind of thing. Um, and may, maybe it speaks to like a lot of what we were doing in the 20th century was really trying to control nature right we're trying to man was trying to be um dominant of nature in some way you know the, uh a lot of these analogies you talk about of you know going to war or dominating this or damming the river or, um subduing nature versus the more mm, healthy perspective i think which is to like try and live in harmony with nature so you know, I, I, I'm, pr I'm a pr pretty radical environmentalist. Like I, my, my views on, on environment are quite radical. Mm. I, I, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't been to a gas station in years. I, I, I consider myself on the fringe of like how, how I feel about like, um, I mean, sorry, it's really specific. I'm just like, I think. CO2 emissions are a problem. That's actually the extent of it. Mm. However, there's a big but. I used to, when I was in college, I used to drive. I used to drive to uh, Chicago almost every weekend because all my friends were older. They graduated early and they went to the big city in the Midwest, which is Chicago. And I'd drive through Gary and I'd see the steel, Bethlehem Steels there. And if I were an industrialist in the 20th century and I built a plant that size and it was running and it was belching thick clouds of smoke into the air. Do you know how proud I'd be? I would be like, I built that. I, I was, I was in awe of the, the, the giganticness of the industrial power of like humanity. And I think it's something to be really proud of. I think like I say it because like there was a part of me, the sort of like, knee jerk lefty environmentalist in the core of my being was like gross man all that exhaust but i tell you i would feel a lot differently if i had built it i'd be real proud of it i thought i think it i would think it's awesome and i think that's sort of the spirit that people were in at the first the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution they're like yeah. look what we can do i mean yeah. it would be really exciting to be part of that yeah and yeah to be completely fair maybe we needed some of that spirit of dominating nature in a way to get out of our situation of depravity, you know, like we actually did need to, you know, domesticate animals and create farmland. And um, there's, there's a degree of discipline necessary to do all these things, but it, I guess like anything else, it could just be taken too far. Yeah. I mean, um, we've become, we have terraformed our planet. We, we've mm -hmm. we've done something accidentally. We've actually proved that terraforming an atmosphere is possible. Mm -hmm. We did it accidentally, but we did it. We we engineered this this our atmosphere mechanically. Let's great. Let's go do it on another planet and let's take mm -hmm. control of the one we have now. We've already done it accidentally. Let's do it on purpose. It's awesome. Yeah, I, my views on this are I don't know. I, I've been reading a lot of Rothbard lately, and I think he's influenced me a lot. But he makes the point that the more high integrity private property rights are, the less environmental pollution we have because essentially a private property right, we always call it a right, but every right is 
simultaneously a responsibility. It has to be, right? Every right is someone's responsibility. It's a matter of allocating, like who gets the right and who gets the responsibility. But with private property rights properly enforced, that the the owner of the asset actually has a, a, an incentive, right, for stewardship and caretaking of that asset as well. So if someone owns a river or owns blocks of the ocean or anything else, and there's pollution or some other uh, detritus or detriment being done to his asset, his or her asset, that they will seek recourse against whoever's doing that. So, you know, I don't know. I hold out some hope that if we could just get this idea of public property, which is I also consider to be an oxymoron off of our back through so through Bitcoin succeeding, that maybe we'd have, for, we'd create a lot more aggregate wealth, which is really important, first of all. And then secondarily, we'd have a, a more properly aligned incentive structure through private property to protect the environment. I, the truth is, I don't know. And I've given it a lot of thought. I know that like, um, I've become... I've become a Bitcoiner first and an environmentalist second. Mm. And I think that's like a change that Bitcoin has wrought within me. Um, and I sort of, uh, it was, um, I, I heard a rabbi once say, uh, look, all you can really do is live according to your own, to your own ethics. You, you only have control over your own, like your own, what you do. You can't make anyone else see the world that you see and so you all you have is really control over what you do and so i've done i i live my life according to my own principles and that's kind of like uh i have to be at peace with that mm -hmm. and so that's i do that both with my my concept of environmentalism and and and, and bitcoin as well and even covid you know I, I even when covid hit it was like if i'm in a place and you know, or right even when it hit, I was in a store and someone came in not wearing a mask. It's like, well, I'm not mad at that guy. I'll just leave. You know, like I'm if I want to be hysterical, which I was, I was a full on paranoid hysteric. And that's my deal. I'm neurotic. That's not it doesn't have to be his deal. I didn't judge him. I wasn't even mad at him. I was just like, I'm going to leave because I'm free to leave. That's it. That <laughs> begins and ends with that. That's great. You can shop. So anyway, that's kind you, of like you had the right to convert yourself out of the store. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the right of convertibility. So the in, I, the interest rate mechanism, I feel like we need to we need to back up and get to this point again. But ultimately, you know, with the they they hijacked the interest rate mechanism to fund government debt in World War II, and that was like the interest rate mechanism was created solely to try and intervene to stabilize fluctuations in the value of the currency. And it worked for a little while, but then the government's like, wait, why don't we do it to keep the price of borrowing government debt low? Mm -hmm. And once they did that, then the interest may, it, it was, it was broken forever and it's still broken. It's a thing that was created for something small and it got turned into a world wrecking device. Yes. When it became a source of government revenue, basically. Yeah. And the perversion of the interest rate is to this day, I mean, I don't know, you've spent a lot of time talking to Snyder and I know that Snyder feels like ultimately I've, I've listened to, I've listened to hours and hours of Snyder hours. Mm -hmm. And I think my first light bulb listening to him, and this was maybe, I'd say I'd, I'd probably done more than 20 to 30 hours. My first light bulb was, Oh, he means the thing he says, which is we don't know how mm -hmm. the euro dollar system works. We don't know. That's his whole point. We don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think most recently I've clued into his second larger point, And I want you to tell me your interpretation is that I think he feels like the central bank doesn't control interest rates, that the bond market does, and that that's telling us something. And it's a charade to think that they control it. And if he's totally right, by the way, then almost everything I've learned and thought is wrong. Yeah, I the second point still a bit unclear to me. My the general takeaway I had was, you know, maybe kind of like 
maybe I'm grasping for analogies here. It started out much more centralized than it is today. Like it's just gotten away from them, right? That when the Fed was established, it had a pretty tight grip on how much money was in circulation, what the interest rate would be, et cetera, et cetera. But then through these evolutions, or I don't, you know, almost like the way I put it to him, and I think he agreed with this, was like the free market was working its way around the artifice erected by central banks. That's what the euro dollar is effectively. It's uh, this derivative scheme that evolved, you know, in the in the dark, so to speak, uh, to get around the restrictions that the Fed had in place on the dollar, right, on international dollar flows and whatnot. So, uh, the rough analogy I was thinking is like everything starts out. Even Bitcoin was like just a centralized idea in Satoshi's mind, and then it became decentralized over over time. And I'm not saying that the I guess I am saying the dollar is more decentralized now than it was at the founding of the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. So the market's like the mar- free market forces are eroding this, you know, attempted uh, stability and, and institutional artifice that the, the Fed has erected. And they've tried to, you know, every time one component of it breaks down, they're putting on some band-aids and duct tape and it's just a mess now. And so if you actually look at these diagrams that I I mean, the joke I make is that the central banking complex is as clear as mud and twice as dirty. You know, you look at these diagrams of the, the institutional relationships and it's just, it, it's crazy. You know, it's just a total nonsensical complex web of, of interrelations that you can't make heads or tails of. Yeah. Um, It's like trying to, trying to read the roadmap for ETH too. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> that's what it that's exactly what it reminds exactly. me exactly and it is proof it is proof of stake right central yeah. banking's proof of stake and that's what eth2 is right i'm a, i'm a huge huge believer in overly broad overly broad simple rules yes that's what makes a game playable yes yes well you we know this we know every time you increase the feature set, you're simultaneously increasing the attack surface and typically in unintended ways, right? This is why we run software code through so many iterations of, of testing and um, bug bounties and all of these things. Because every time they add something to the code, they're adding exploits that they themselves don't understand. Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is, the, the entire crypto market is cleaved neatly in two between Bitcoin and everything else. Yeah, the reason for that for sure. is that Bitcoin is designed to function as a black market money when the state ultimately withdraws consent for it to work. Mm-hmm. Bit, Bitcoin works whether or not it has permission from the state. Right. And nothing else in the quote unquote crypto sphere, I hate even saying it, has that property. There's just nothing else. Right. There's literally nothing else. And like when my friends or someone asks me, well, what are you worried that the government's going to ban it? I'm like, I reject the premise of the question. The government's going to ban it. It, it, We've we've been planning on the government to ban it. It's specifically designed to be banned. Right. Yeah. It will be banned and it will keep working. No, I'm not worried about it. That's the whole point. The whole point is that bans will come and Bitcoin will keep functioning in the background. So no, I'm not worried about it. It's, it, it the, the, <laughs> the whole design of the system is premised upon those bands. And if and, and if you're work if you're working in a crypto system that does not rely does not count on being banned, and does not give you at least the option of continuing to function in the face of that ban, then what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Why do you have that money? <laughs> I was thinking about this yesterday. That the very term regulation really i think is just the intended to regulate the economic flows within the purview of the state so that they can regulate their take ultimately right you're trying to make economic flows very legible so that they can be taxed and i was like why is you know what is bitcoin doing here and i was like oh it makes all the sense in the world bitcoin is completely self-regulated right it makes its own rules and you know, walks to the beat of its own drum. 
And so in that way, it just bucks all regulation. Like the, you can't do anything to it. You can't pass a law or a rule to change yeah. it. It just doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, like you you can't regulate Bitcoin any more than you can regulate volcanoes. Exactly. Okay, we passed a law. Volcanoes can't erupt. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. Good. It's good law. Yeah. Yeah. And then so in do and to tie this back to gold, it's like gold was sort of serving that function in the what I call the analog ages, which is everything pre-digital, that it was functioning as a regulator of government in a way, right? If a government was irresponsible totally. with monetary policy or they were excessively oppressive, then gold would leave their country pretty much. Um, or, or if they were you know, too much of a net importer, gold would clear, clearly leave their country. But governments if they were able competitive. To, yes. But they were able to get a hold. Well, a couple of things are wrong with this. One, they were able to get a hold of this regulator and basically buck it, right, through central banking. They just monopolized gold and then abandoned it. And then two, the other problem with it was war, right? That you could go and physically take gold. That was a problem because there's incentives to violence, which degrades the global division of labor and et cetera, et cetera. But with Bitcoin, you get something like almost a step change or evolutionary leap above that. You get this totally ungovernable governor of government, something like that. <laughs> and it's just incredible to get your head around it. Well, this is the passage we were talking earlier about central banks actually operating in their own selfish best interest to maintain the value of the currency. The, the passage from the book is this, no country could count on foreign aid for sustained indulgences in credit expansion. Each had to be amenable to monetary discipline and to rely on the enlightened, long-range self-interest of all participants in the game including the vested interests of note issuing institutions in protecting their own solvency. That just remind. there's nothing more that reminds me of the game theory of Bitcoin than that. And that was, yeah. those were the operating, operating principles of the gold system. Yeah. It's they just... all, everyone had to be amenable to monetary discipline and rely on the enlightened long range self-interests of all participants in the game. Nothing, I can't trust anything better in the world than your own selfish best interest. Right. Why are you helping exactly. me? Well, I always look at, why is someone helping me? Well, if I can figure out how they gain from helping me, then, I mean, look, I, I know that like um, people help for selfless reasons. I know, I, I, I know that. I'm not saying people don't do, self, don't do selfless things, but when it's a, if it's a complex business arrangement, I don't want to, I, I don't, and a lot of a lot of times in business, I felt like people have sort of sort of gotten the story that someone's helping me out, doing me a favor. Mm. I don't trust that. Mm. But if I can see how if I can see how what you're doing is in your own selfish best interest, then I trust that. Yeah, and that's right. what Bitcoin is. All the participants, you're relying on the selfish best interest of every participant to run the software that maintains the hard cap. Right. And what better coordinating force could there be? You know, none. It's, uh, none. Yeah, the so many things come to mind. One is uh, no man is better than his incentives. You know, it's like yeah. if you can achieve that alignment between the individual and the collective, like such that the individual, in pursuit of their individual best interest, is what contributes to the collective best interest, that's the ideal state. And I think, again, I've been reading a lot of Rothbard about this, like in my mind, the boundary of private property is the correct restriction for that. So it's like, you want every individual to maximally pursue their self-interest. I want everyone to yes. get as rich yes. and innovative yes. and as you know, expressing their ingenuity with maximum throughput as they can. So long as that expression does not permeate the boundary of my own person or property or anyone else's person or property. And then if you have everyone doing that, you're, you're actually creating the most wealth and want satisfaction in the world, right? There's no taking, it's all making. And so this, I mean, that's the game. That's the game we're trying to create. We've been trying to create. That's what 
That's those are the foundational principles of the United States, right? Which we inherited from the Magna Carta, life, liberty, and inviolable property. We bastardized it in the U S constitution for reasons I'm not entirely sh- clear on in the pursuit of happiness, but it, in the Magna Carta in 1215, it was inviolable property. Mm. And that's what we have now. It's like Bitcoin is like, we actually have, it's amazing. I may have said this to you before, so excuse me if I'm repeating myself, but it's amazing to me that we dreamed up this concept or ideal 800 plus years ago. And now we've like created a working implementation 13 years ago. This Max Hillebrand calls like his, his, articulation of the ownership of Bitcoin is like, uh, is so, it's so unforgettable to me that, you know, it's like the, A, it's the most ownership you can have of anything. Mm-hmm. And that, and that, and that by comparison, he makes the point that in, that the real world is full only of simulated ownership, mm-hmm. like title to my house, title to my car, recourse to the legal system is actually the legal system is everyone is collaborating in a fiction whereby I own this house and they're simulating my ownership through this chain of title to my house. But Bitcoin, you can pass a law or you can put me in jail. You can even torture me, but ultimately if I give it to you, you have, I have to voluntarily give it to you. It just can't, it can't be confiscated. And it's the greatest property right we have. And then if you, but then if you want to get abstract about it, the thing that I actually own is my knowledge of a private key, which is just a number. And I don't own that number mm-hmm. and I don't even own the Bitcoin because it's, it might be on someone else's server. Mm-hmm. So do you own that? I, I like thinking about it. It's a little too abstract. I actually think that, yeah, if you go, if you go to the deep, if you go to the deepest level, it's the deepest kind of ownership you'll ever have. And then if you go one level deeper, you don't even own that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a secret ultimately, which is like, I don't know, self-knowledge or something that you're guarding from others, but it's shrouded in the near infinitude of like, you know, the universe level mathematics of encryption, something like that. like the single atom in a universe kind of thing, the ultimate needle in a haystack. Um, but you're right. It's like, it's not technically even ownership, right? If it's just information, you're just no. keeping a secret through mathematics. You have a large number. There's a large number. Your private key is literally a number, an integer. It's a non-integer. What's a number with decimal point, point, points? <sighs> a real number? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, it's a number. It's definitely and, a number. <laughs> and you don't own that number. You just have knowledge of what the number is. It's so large that no one could ever guess it. And that's the, the, the fact that you have it like stored somewhere, your secret that defines your ownership. I don't know, man, like, you know, the, the, like that you can, so like I have a, I have a wallet that has nothing in it, but I just have the seed phrase memorized. So it's like, if I ever needed to, put money in that. I just know that I've got at least one seed phrase memorized mm-hmm. and I have an, I have a fable, the seed phrase is in a fable. And I'm mm-hmm. like, are we in, are, am I living in the Hobbit? <laughs> that like, I know if I have a fable that I could teach my, my, my kids. And if they remember the fable, they can get the treasure. <laughs> it is, it's magic, if, right? This is- like if there was like an emergency and I was lucky, like the military pulled up and they said, get into a C-130 with only your t-shirt. You have nothing else. And I am go to some war-torn refugee camp and I live there for five years and I don't die and I keep my brain cells intact. And if I remember the fable, all my wealth materializes before me. I mean, when I grasped that, I was all in. I was mentally all in. And I was like, I was like, I thought I'm going to, this is like a couple of years ago. I'm going to write an essay on, would it be good to be a hundred percent Bitcoin? And I thought about it for a couple of days and I was like, that's the easy, for me, emotionally, that's the easiest thing to write. I think actually a more valuable essay would be, 
what reasons are there not to be 100% Bitcoin? That's the more challenging <laughs> essay to, to write. So for a conservative funny. person like myself, never wrote that one either. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. Like you're just passing along this fable that that contains all of your worldly energy that you've expended ever, right? In theory, like if you're 100 Bitcoin, you've got all your wealth in it. Then, um, yeah, it's really incredible, and it, it's also scary for a lot of people, but. I, I think that that fear is rooted in just taking the established order for granted. And if, you know, again, if you study history, like it's anything but stable. Yeah, I just don't see it. I don't see any way out mathematically for our debt other than to it be it to be inflated away. I just mm -hmm. don't see any. I keep coming, you know, I, I go through we were talking earlier i because all i'm doing these days is studying these super speculative bubble periods in history weimar in the 20s america in the 20s america now steeped in bitcoin culture and watching markets the way i watch them i am terrified that i have it all wrong and so i go through this loop of uh the participants in these older systems were probably smarter than I am, and they got it wrong. I might have it wrong. I could be destitute. Well, why, why did I do this? I did this because I was holding dollars, and, that, and, and I became indignant about holding dollars because I kept falling farther and farther behind. Why was I falling farther and farther behind? Well, this year, Expenses on Social Security, Medicare, and interest on the debt was $2.9 trillion. U.S. net tax revenue, $2.4 trillion. So before the government has paid for anything else the government does, the military, uh, salaries, buildings, air conditioning, postal service, just with Social Security, Medicare, and interest on the debt, they've already exceeded revenue by $500 billion. So like they're not paying off the principal anytime soon. Right. And because they can't pay off the principal and they're rolling the principal and they're accruing interest on the principal they're rolling plus borrowing more. Oh, by the way, not only did we have a shortfall of 500 billion just for those three light items I mentioned, we're on track. This is not my, this is, the government will tell you, you can go to, I think it's spending.gov. 10 trillion is how much they're going to spend this year. That's how, what that's, that's this year. So um, mathematically, there's no way for the debt to ever get paid off without radical, radical sort of like if, if they, if they, if they brought out the kind of austerity you'd need to pay off the debt, the United States would become balkanized like within what administration? It would just be, it would be too upsetting. I d there's no other way. There's no other way for the debt to get paid other than inflating it away. And by the way, it's actually the easiest way. And it's the most politically expedient way because the, the maturity structure of our debt is such that like, these effects get the, the maturity structure is longer than the political cycle. Mm -hmm. So like right. the debt, you know, they don't roll all the debt every year. They roll this year that I think they're going to roll like 1.7 trillion total gets rolled. So like, you know, that's not that much. Biden won't feel the difference. So then I get back to like, no, this is the way, the only way out for our monetary system is to continue to inflate away the cost of the debt. Otherwise, it would just it would just lead to too much political chaos. Mm -hmm. And then I'm back to where I started, which was, well, I don't want to keep my money in cash. And I don't the stock market is, I don't understand it. I'm not interested in it. And it seems way overvalued and has since for me since 2015. Mm -hmm. Real estate carrying costs are too high. 
And, you know, and it's also a lot of work and it's not divisible and portable. And I'm not buying bonds. I sold all my bonds. I'm not buying gold. So like, there's nothing to cash out into. So like, I go through this cycle of like, am I just a degenerate who like thinks he's getting rich and he's not? Am I just in it for more dollars secretly? Because if I'm in it, I'll tell you, if I look deep into my soul and I think that I'm in it just for more dollars, then I'm, then the whole, then I, then everything I've done is a waste. Yeah. Everything I'm, everything I'm talking about, that I'm self-deluded. If I'm just trying to get more dollars, then ev- everything is a waste. So if I'm just speculating to try, if I don't understand the difference and I think that dollars are going to make me rich, then yeah, this whole thing was probably not worth it. But if I really feel like the dollars are losing value and I do, then I'm looking for something else. So that's, it brings me, it brings me back to today, but it's, it's a difficult loop to go through because you, you, you go through the cycle of, I mean, we are speculating. What we're doing is inherently speculative and you know, that's, that is dangerous. Mm -hmm. That that is dangerous. I've actually stopped trying to convince family to buy Bitcoin and friends. Mm -hmm. I used to have a standing offer and I did this for a couple of friends. I said, look, just buy the Bitcoin. If you aren't, if you aren't profitable, if it isn't more worth more in dollar terms in 18 months, I will buy your Bitcoin back from you at the price you paid for it. I will guarantee you that deal right now. And, you know, I had a couple of friends take me up on it. Okay, fine. If you're going to get, if you're going to make me whole, I said, I will guarantee you, I'll make you all do it with my parents. I did it with some close friends and they mm. all turned out fine. But like the stress I felt in the meantime, mm. cause they all, they, none, all, they only think about the dollars. Mm-hmm. It's all they think about. Right. So like, we're all speculating somehow and it just feels like, I don't know. The, the reality is we could be wrong. That, that's just the truth. Some, some, you know, the people, people, sometimes people ask me, I know I've been talking for a long time. This is sort of therapy for me, but <laughs> no, that's why we're here. People have been asking me for a long time, what have you been up to? And I'm like, oh, I'm full-time Bitcoin. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you're like trading it. I go, no, I've never traded it. I buy it and I hold it. <laughs> well, what's the full-time part? The full-time part is building up a wall of conviction so that I can hold it. That's the full-time job. Fucking, and it is easier said than done, right? What you just described, this loop. I mean, we go through it endlessly, right? Because it, again, as Bitcoiners, we are thinking adversarially constantly. Where am I wrong? You know, what, what are what are the chinks in the armor? And it it's uh, it's possessing in a lot of ways, and you know, I'm sure you know, our partners, our our romantic partners and friends can probably attest to it that um, we won't shut the fuck up about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, to me, you know, something that really jumps out here is etymology is always so important. I'm always blown away when I really start to peel apart a word and look where it came from. And, you know, there's a lot of different rabbit holes to go down because, it usually grounds out in a certain language, but then you can look at the source of that language and uh, it just it gets really interesting. And with cash, the word cash specifically, just going back to the French word, I think it's pronounced casse, which meant money box. Basically, it meant, mm. you know, in, in the time even this book was written, it meant like an instrument, a final settlement, a bearer asset. Um, so, when, again, when you talk about what what do you hold in this world where everyone's being ripped apart by this speculative fervor or or psychological i think you called it a gambling psychology earlier that is induced by inflation actually all right it's like the money even if people don't get it they feel it so there's this tacit procedural level understanding that the money is being deteriorated or debased and you're just you're you're instigated into this flurry of activity to try to do anything to outpace the debasement effectively. And it's like, where else would you be than in the ultimate bearer asset, as we described earlier, this ultimate form of property that's completely insulated from the opinions and speculations of everyone else in the world? 
there's just nowhere else to cash out into except into the ultimate form of cash itself, the ultimate money box itself. And to your point about speculation, it's like, yeah, we are speculating. But one of the things that really reinforced my conviction was, you know, reading Mises. It's like all action is speculative. We can never know the outcome of any action. Even things with high degree of certainty, right? The sun is going to come up tomorrow. Well, we're speculating. We don't actually know. So you, you kind of have to choose your speculation. And with Bitcoin, it seems like the fear related to its speculation is that it's just new. You know, it's only 13-ish years old. But there's another side to that where it's like, well, it's already the most secure computing network in human history. It's basically done what it's supposed to do flawlessly for 13 years solid. It's a trillion dollar asset. We're, you know, the number one way we conceive of it is in dollar terms. The dollar is being debased at an unprecedented rate. So it is, you know, there's this real like flip of the dynamo that occurs where you're like, okay, it's speculative, but it's also hyper conservative amid the conditions. I have, I have five qualities that this used to be my like investing rubric, like uh, an investment had to satisfy five conditions. And almost always it was a technology thing that satisfied all five. I have to love it. The first is I have to love it. And I use Mm. that word love Mm. to invest in something. I have to love the thing. And there weren't many things that I loved. But like loving a thing means that if it goes to zero, you at least know why you got in. Mm. Got to use it every day. It's number two. It has to be something that um, people don't really understand Mm -hmm. quite yet. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that is misreported on frequently in the mainstream press. That helps. And it, that's number four. And then number five, as a result of numbers three and four, it's not understood and it's misreported on. Number five, it has to be undervalued. Mm. So if it satisfies all those conditions, I was pretty much always all in. And sometimes I was right, sometimes I was wrong. But Bitcoin is like the hardest, the hardest buy of those. And it's like, the way I feel about Bitcoin is like a larger, more intense version of like, when Kindle first came out and I had a bunch of friends, like for the, for the first couple of years of, the kin, of, of Kindles, a friend would be like, oh, you know, that's never going to replace books. Like just books just feel so good. And, you know, I, I'm, I actually still buy books. So like, I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you, you know, I, I would be really allowing. Sure. I understand you. You don't, you don't want to have an electronic thing. You like the book experience, but I'd say maybe three or four years into that, I stopped just being nice about it. And I was like, I don't care what you think. Like it's Kindle is going to replace books. It's going like, yes, books. I'm not saying books will stop existing, but it's going to replace books. It's just, it's just so much better. I don't care what you think. You don't even have the power to keep the book industry alive. You can have any book at any point from any point on the globe. You can carry your whole library with you. And, and you're a hypocrite because if you think that the value of the experience is not based on the text, but is based on the tactile experience, then you're, then you're saying the text kind of like doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I would get really aggro with people because I just felt like they, this, um, the inability to perceive the implications of a new technology was like, I saw it everywhere, even email, even people, I have friends tell me, you know, I had an email address in 1989 and friends tell me, well, you, you, people are, you're still going to send letters. What is this computer thing? And I was like, no, (laughs) yes, it's going to replace letters. And I just have the same feeling about Bitcoin. Like I just, it's going to replace the money. And, and, and by the way, this isn't as like trivial as books or emails. This is money. My conviction is so high. And yet I spend a lot of time plumbing the depths of that conviction. And what have I missed? Yeah. Excellent points there as someone that, I'm surrounded by books right now, obsessed with books, but I've also and resisted the Kindle for the longest, but now I read my Kindle more than books because of all the reasons, right? I've got thousands of books on there and it's easier to read when I go to sleep. It's easier to put in my pocket and read when I'm, you know, 
if my daughter's taking a nap or I'm in line or whatever, it's just more accessible. Um, and I, you know, yeah, it's just digital, man. Digital is so powerful. And so I like your, your framework and it, maybe I'll put this back to you that I don't think Bitcoin can ever be fully understood. You know, as, <laughs> as Lop said, no one's found the bottom to the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So by that logic, could we say then that Bitcoin will always be undervalued? Well, uh, you know, I had this, I had this, I had this realization. I, I wrote this uh, essay called the sat comma standard. And it was mm -hmm. probably the greatest moment of my life was when sailor tweeted it out. <laughs> and the best part of that process of writing that was when I was like, thinking about when they were going to add decimal points to Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin as a pricing mechanism in the economy has to be granular enough so that it can capture the smallest unit of value, the smallest thing that needs to be priced in the economy. If you can express it in Bitcoin, then it doesn't need to be smaller. Like if Bitcoin is worth a million, then a sat is worth a penny. Do we need to add a zero? Do you need anything smaller than a penny? There are accounting values that are sub-cent accounting values, but we don't see them as consumers. I would imagine that if you're like craft foods and you're like computing the cost of a can of beans, you might need a sub-cent value. Mm -hmm. So it might be that when Bitcoin is worth a million dollars nominally, we start need to adding zeros so that we have a sub-cent value, but maybe we don't. Now, when Bitcoin's worth 10 million, then do we need to add a zero? I don't know when that point is, but at some point we're going to have to add a zero. And then I realized that because Bitcoin is scarce and society will only get wealthier in real terms as it advances technologically, then we're going to always need to be adding zeros because society will get orders of magnitude wealthier. And as the the buying power of Bitcoin gets greater and greater, you'll lose granular control of the pricing mechanism. And the addition of zeros to the protocol will be like a bell that tolls the wealth of society. Wow. Every order of magnitude wealthier that we get, we add another zero. Fucking beautiful. <laughs> Never have I thought of that before. And I've thought about the number zero on Bitcoin quite a bit. So you have one of the most <laughs> profound articles on Bitcoin and the number zero. That though, what you just said is beautiful. I mean, that maybe that's part of the institutionalization or ritualization of Bitcoin, right? So oh, yeah. our, our kids don't forget, like we we ring the bell every order of magnitude and wealth. That's that's beautiful. Yeah. We just got 10 times wealthier. We're going to add another zero. And I also, just for the record, because I want to get this idea out there. I, I think that the Satoshi should always be the smallest unit of Bitcoin. The Satoshi shouldn't mean it's one 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. The Satoshi should always be whatever the smallest unit is at the time. Mm. So there'll essentially be like a stock split of Satoshis. If you had gotcha. one sat, then you add a zero. Now you have 10 sats. Got it. Because... Otherwise, it gets real confusing. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets yeah. real confusing. Yeah, that makes um, sense. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with this question, because the rest of what we talk about, and this will give me somebody to think about for the next time we talk. Do we think we need to talk about whether or not we think a fiat currency will exist alongside Bitcoin? Because if we do, then a lot of what uh, we've mapped out to talk about and the nitty gritty of the gold standard becomes really relevant. And that's sort of why I went into it. But if there's going to be no fiat alongside Bitcoin, I don't know if it's as relevant. There's a lot of inside baseball with the gold standard that's really interesting. It becomes more interesting if you think maybe a future fiat coexisting with gold, like maybe it maps onto that. So like, I kind of feel like that's that's the thing we need to pick up with and that'll decide the course the rest of this conversation perfect well 
I'm really looking forward to it. We're we're slowly getting through this outline, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the the nutrient density of the conversation has been fantastic, in my opinion. Yeah, man. I mean, it's really, you know this this conversation. I'm like, I have, like when I'm talking to you, I'm like at the I'm, I'm it's like I'm. I'm I'm at the very edge of my knowledge and cognition. It's at the I'm the very limit of it. It's like I'm it's like I'm on a car going really fast, outrunning a dust storm, and I can and 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 the dust storm is overtaking me, and I kind of can't see where I'm going. Yeah, it's it's great. I'm there as as well, and it, you know this dialogue is the intellectual division of labor. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's really helpful. It's talking it through with you is just very helpful for me to 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 refine these ideas and 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 figure out where I'm to test some things out, figure out where I'm right and where I'm wrong. I've yeah, same and, and therapeutic, as you said earlier. It's nice to just you know what Peterson says something I think so interesting. I think about a lot is that we outsource our sanity to those around us, and that is really at the basis of my bullishness with Bitcoin, because it's one thing to do all this exploration yourself and draw certain conclusions, but it's another thing entirely to like talk with other people that have approached it from different angles that have reached similar conclusions. You get this huge network consilience yeah. around the bull case for Bitcoin. And it's just like, holy shit, this thing is huge. So 